All right, maybe we can get started. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor McKinley from Columbia University and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory to give the ESS department seminar. Um, Galen uh, did her undergraduate research or undergraduate education at Rice in engineering, and then she went to MIT to do her PhD. She then did postdoctoral work at the Instituto Nacional uh, de Ecologia. My Spanish is not very good in Mexico and at Princeton University. She was a professor for a while uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, before going to Columbia. And she's done a lot of work on uh, CO2 fluxes between the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, and she will talk about some of this, I think, today. So uh, please uh, welcome Galen. You can go ahead when you want. Yeah, thanks, Francois. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, um, everybody from uh, your department, um, it's been a pleasure to meet with a few of you today um, and uh, to be able to give you this seminar. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about using models, data, and theory to understand some aspects of the modern ocean carbon sink. Um, and um, I am happy to take clarifying questions during the talk. Um, if you just, uh, uh, I guess, Francois said he'd be monitoring that. If you have a, a quick question, please feel free to interrupt me. So um, my work in uh, my group in the, uh, the Ocean Carbon Group at Columbia and Lamont, uh, we're really asking the question, how does physical variability and change modify the ocean carbon sink? Um, and we're doing this uh, with models of the ocean circulation biogeochemistry, both uh, forest timecast models and a um, and couple climate models, and also um, using data analysis and machine learning increasingly in recent years. Uh, my group, uh, actually, uh, my, my group uh, pre-pandemic <laughs> is shown here in the picture. Uh, a couple of people have graduated now, uh, and um, uh, uh, so they are the ones who do a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about, so I'll begin by thanking them for all their efforts. So the outline for my talk today, I want to describe what I envision as the ocean carbon sink, how I, um, how I understand that, and then talk about two studies that we've done looking at the me mechanisms of decadal variability in the ocean carbon sink, both from observations and from models and from some theory. And then um, we're going to dive in uh, to actually those observationally based products, uh, the, the data uh, estimates we have of the ocean carbon sink, and try to assess their uncertainty uh, um, in, in the second part of the talk. So to begin with, when I say the ocean carbon sink, uh, what do I mean? I'm sure many of you have a, have a good idea, but for those who don't, <laughs> um, uh, I want to remind everyone that all of our emitted carbon does not remain in the atmosphere. Uh, we emit, uh, of course, by burning fossil fuels primarily, uh, that carbon enters the atmosphere, but it is cycled and there's a significant sink, we believe, in the land biosphere, and there's also a very significant sink in the ocean. Uh, and so understanding how the relationship between our emissions and and this actual rate of accumulation in the atmosphere really requires us to understand what's going on with these sinks, these natural sinks as we call them. So my interest is in the ocean. So what do we know about the ocean carbon uptake? So this is the um, a, a map here on the left of the column inventory of anthropogenic carbon in the ocean. Uh, in uh, 2007, uh, all, and it's accumulative from 1800, so all across the industrial era. And what we see is that we have most, uh, the most intense uh, kind of bullseye of column inventory of anthropogenic carbon in the North Atlantic and also in the mode waters of the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and if we integrate over this whole map, we see that about 40% of all fossil carbon has gone into the ocean. So um, of all the emissions of fossil carbon um, uh, equivalent, um, if, we, if we take that, about 40% of that amount has gone into the ocean, about 140 petagrams of carbon. It depends a little bit on what date you use for the endpoint, and it's increasing at about two petagrams of carbon per year, two to three. This is based on high quality repeat hydrography data. And if we break the data down into different uh, sections in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian here, um, we see that most of this anthropogenic carbon is of course in the surface ocean. And that only in the Atlantic um, is this map from, a, from the a 2004 estimate, only in this 
um, uh, section do we see anthropogenic carbon below 2000 meters. So just to make the point that the ocean is absorbing this carbon, but it's still mostly stuck in the surface ocean. Uh, and if we uh, look at all of the sources and sinks, um, here is a cumulative estimate of the carbon sources and sinks from Katiwala, updated through 2011, showing the sources on the left and the sinks on the right. We see that the fossil fuels are, of course, our dominant source of carbon cumulatively. Um, and uh, the, the net land, although certainly a significant sink now, was a significant source up through um, the 1950s or so. It was a dominant source through the 1950s. Um, now the net land is approximately neutral when accumulated over the industrial era, and, um, and the fossil fuels is the, really the primary source. And then the sink is um, mostly, of course, the atmosphere, but the ocean is the significant um, damper of that accumulation rate in the atmosphere. If we look forward, uh, here's a paper from Jim Randerson and colleagues uh, using a CSM and a, and a high emission scenario through 2300. We see that we expect this accumulation in the ocean to definitely continue, particularly if we put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, it's going to continue quite rapidly. And so the ocean is going to continue to damp uh, climate change, uh, particularly if we follow the high emission scenario. And even if we don't follow a high emission scenario, the ocean uh, accumulation of carbon will be critical to setting the, uh, the total amount of uh, carbon that remains in the atmosphere and the total amount of um, uh, climate change that occurs. So we need to understand how the sink works and uh, we need to, um, uh, to understand how it's changing and varying over time. So how does this sink work? Here is a, um, a schematic of the, the, the carbon, uh, the total air-sea carbon flux at the surface broken down into its natural or pre-industrial component and this anthropogenic perturbation uh, that is due to the growing uh, concentration in the atmosphere. So specifically, when I say the natural carbon cycle, this is the carbon cycle in the ocean that would have occurred if the atmosphere had remained flat uh, up here in the, in the top right. We see if the atmosphere had remained at 280 parts per million, what would the ocean carbon sink look like? And that is on the left side here. On the right side is the addition to that cycle that's due to anthropogenic carbon accumulation in the atmosphere. So the natural carbon cycle is the part that includes the biological pump and of course the overturning circulation and the fact that we have, for example, western boundary currents where waters are cooling off as they move from uh, south to north, causing additional carbon uptake just by that cooling. That's all in the natural carbon cycle. And uh, because of, of both the high latitude sinking of, of waters and the biological pump, we have this um, this profile of natural carbon in the ocean that is lesser at the surface and uh, greater at depth. So this is the, 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 the net accumulation, uh, the net gradient from surface to depth is really dominated by the natural carbon cycle. On top of this, we have uh, this perturbation of the anthropogenic carbon, which quantitatively is in fact a relatively small amount of the total. The, this is only about um, uh, 70 uh, millimole per meter cubed, uh, the, the axis here, while this is, um, this is all the way up to 2200 up here. So the vast majority of the carbon in the ocean is not due to anthropogenic activities, but is the natural component. And if we add these two together, the natural and the anthropogenic, we get this dashed line, which is the total. And so again, you can see that the anthropogenic is just this relatively small perturbation on top of this background natural cycle. So this matters when we want to say, when we want to understand how the carbon cycle is working. And specifically, I want to contrast these two plots that you might have seen before, similar plots of the, air, the ocean carbon sink. So the first is what I showed you before, this map of the anthropogenic carbon and uh, the fact that it is surface intensified. And this is only this anthropogenic carbon. This is a database estimate trying to back out how much additional carbon is in the ocean due to human activities. Um, and this is just this part. So it's just a relatively small, um, small component of the total. 
Well, if we want to understand the air sea fluxes of carbon, uh, which is the total carbon cycle, we have to sort of see through and look also at the natural carbon cycle that includes um, the, the biological pump and includes um, a much the much greater um, number of processes and variability that's out there because of the natural cycle of carbon in the ocean. So both of these maps are, um, are ways to uh, quantify the ocean carbon sink. On the left, we have the mean air sea CO2 fluxes from observationally based products, which I'll talk more about. This is a flux rate in moles per meter squared per year. Um, and this is one way that we quantify the ocean carbon sink, how much did the ocean take up today or next year or last year? Well, on the right, this is this integrated column inventory. What's the accumulation over the whole industrial era? And that's a column integral in moles per meter squared. And um, that's the anthropogenic part. So in some sense, when we ask the question, how much carbon is the ocean taking up and how does this modify the um, accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere, we're really asking about this right-hand side. But we, but the challenge there is that we can't make these estimates, but on decadal timescales, when we have uh, ship-based surveys that go out and make estimates, we don't have these kinds of data enough to tell us what the annual variability is in the ocean carbon sink. So in order to actually understand how the ocean carbon sink is, is varying on shorter time scales than sort of decadal or long term, we have to look at the air sea fluxes. And so we have to look at this left hand side of the map and see through the biological cycling to, to understand the, the total carbon cycle. So looking at that variability, we go, we, we go here now to the global carbon budget, which is uh, every year put together an estimate of a variety of researchers trying to tell us uh, how much fossil fuel do we burn this year? How much land use change occurred? What was the ocean sink? What was the land sink? What was the atmospheric accumulation? This budget is probably about to come out in the next few weeks because it always comes out right before the COP, um, the, 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 um, IP, the, um, the uh, UNFCCC meetings and uh, COP26 is about to start in Glasgow. So, so this will be soon updated with the 2021 version. But for, this is a 2018 plot that they made similar in the last two years. And what we see here is that we have the fossil carbon here, the, the, the burning of fossil fuels. We have the land use change emission. Those, these are the sources on the top. And on the bottom, we have this uptake by the ocean uptake by the land, and then the rest uh, is the accumulation in the atmosphere. And, it, and it, here you can see that the atmosphere gets about 50% of all, of, retains about 50% of the emissions. The land takes up about 50% and the ocean about 50% every year um, in, 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 in recent years. On this plot, you also see the reflection of the um, sources in this gray line here. And since it's a closed system, the, glo the, the, the global carbon cycle, um, the sources in the sinks should be equal. And if we perfectly understood the whole system, uh, the, the, the black line here uh, would exactly match that gray line and we would have a perfectly closed budget. In fact, it's not a perfectly closed budget. Of course, in some years we get lucky, the, the numbers work out exactly right, but usually there's some difference, some budget imbalance. And, and this budget imbalance is a challenge because it makes it, um, uh, it makes it difficult for us as carbon cycle scientists to tell the world that we, we really know where the carbon cycle is, is coming from and where it's gone to, and to be able to say we can help um, uh, we can understand what's going to happen if we start cutting emissions and how much that's going to affect the atmospheric growth rate, for example. So, so to put a little more meat on those bones, um, it seems like right now uncertainty in the natural carbon fluxes really remains quite large, and we need to reduce it in order to better support our international climate policy. So shown here is um, uh, this observed atmospheric growth rate, the one I showed you on the previous slide. And here is the, the reconstructed uh, growth rate, emissions minus land minus ocean. So similar, a similar, uh, a reworking of the same data that's on this slide, just focusing on the atmospheric growth rate and the difference between the fossil and land use minus the, the sinks. 
And uh, so you can see that this gray and black line here are quite highly correlated, right? And so for most of our studies, we would say, yeah, we really, we've really got that one. You know, we really know and we can really say what's driving the observed variations. But, but certainly there's, there's also imbalance here. And, and the challenge with that imbalance is that if we project those standard deviations forward, and then we impose upon those potential um, cuts in emissions, uh, say a, a, one, a zero percent per year, which would be Paris, and then any additional cuts off of that, such as zero percent per year growth rate or negative one percent per year growth rate in emissions. Um, we would find that it would take many years uh, at one standard deviation, five years at least, and perhaps even 10 years to get to two standard deviations so that we could actually attribute change in the atmospheric growth rate to cuts in emissions. Because this variability in the natural uh, sinks in the land and the ocean are sort of confounding our ability to detect change in the atmosphere. Um, and so the more we, we tamp down those uncertainties on the sinks in the land and the ocean, and also on emission rates also need to be better understood, the more we can begin to um, attribute any changes in what happens in the atmosphere accurately. Because it's gonna look, basically it's gonna look bad if we start to cut emissions, people are making progress, and, and the carbon cycle community can't explain why the, um, the atmosphere, for example, isn't, um, the growth rate isn't changing or isn't changing very quickly. Um, and maybe it's because there was an El Nino, maybe it was because there were some forest fires, maybe it was because of this other reason, but we need to be able to diagnose those changes as accurately as possible to be able to um, uh, diagnose the effects of mitigation. So some of the background and why we care about the ocean carbon sink. So more specifically, how do we quantify the ocean carbon sink? Um, and particularly its variability uh, and these air sea fluxes. So the way we do that is by uh, measuring the PCO2 of the ocean uh, and uh, calculating it's different from the atmosphere and then using um, uh, some basic um, budget equations that tell us that we have a, a, a some solubility, we have ice cover, and we have a piston velocity. So the air sea flux is really proportional to um, the this delta PCO2. And since the atmosphere is, is well mixed, it's really proportional to the ocean PCO2. So essentially where the ocean PCO2 is greater than atmospheric, we're going to have outgassing. And where the um, PCO2 is less than atmospheric, we're going to have ingassing. And we see that in this plots over here. This is the, um, the PCO2 on the, on the top in the green uh, yellow color bar, where um, uh, the um, atmosphere, it, and the atmosphere is in, in, in red here. So the dark colors are greater than atmosphere and the light colors are less than atmosphere. And on the bottom, we have the flux and you can see that we have outgassing, for example, in the equatorial Pacific, uh, where we have these high PCO2s. But the PCO2 that we have uh, to, uh, to quantify the sink is, um, is certainly not observed everywhere. We can't measure it from satellite. We have to measure it from ships. And this is a map of the database of PCO2 observations um, that is updated every year. This is a 2017 a version of it, but it, it does continue to be updated. And this is from uh, container ships, volunteer observing ships, as well as research vessels. And these are all the observations just averaged up to give you an idea of where the observations are. And you can see that there are uh, regions that are, appear to be relatively well sampled, such as the Northern Hemisphere, or high latitudes or mid latitudes, I guess you could, should say. And there are other regions that appear to be very poorly sampled. Uh, the challenge with this is this is actually 60 uh, years of data or so. Um, and in fact, if we looked at any one month, the actual data is extremely sparse. Okay, so we have June of 2016, which is actually a relatively well observed month. Um, and so any one month is going to look something like this. Um, and uh, so we have a challenge of how do we go from these very sparse PCO2 observations into the full coverage time evolving, evolving flux maps that we want to have in order to be able to understand the variability of the ocean sink. Luckily, we do have full coverage data for things that are related to the partial pressure of CO2. For example, we have SST, 
We have chlorophyll. These tell us about solubility in the case of, of SST and circulation to some degree. The chlorophyll tells us about a biological um, uh, cycling. There's also mixed layer depths um, that can be taken from a climatology. And so we can begin to build statistical relationships that help us relate PCO2 where observed um, to these uh, variables that are observed at all locations. And the way that that's become kind of common to do this is um, to use a neural network to take the PCO2 observations where we have them and then to train a neural network on the sparse data. So have the neural network build the relationships between PCO2 and these driver variables so that then we can predict PCO2 at all points in space and calculate the CO2 flux. And it is by this process that we have these um, full coverage maps that are observationally based. They are not observations, but they are based on observations. Um, so this is, this is the, the main way that we're now able to um, quantify uh, from an observational perspective, the ARC carbon flux. But as I will talk about, this is not without uncertainty and we need to understand those uncertainties. The other way we understand the ocean carbon sink is with um, ocean biochemical hindcast models. So we can run a, a physical model. Here's a nice um, uh, animation from GFDL. We can add to that um, simulated, uh, simulated carbon processes in biology and make an estimate of the ocean carbon sink. Uh, we had the models for quite a while. Um, for more than 20 years, uh, but the observationally based products are really relatively new. So how do they compare? How much do we have coherence between what we get from variety of models and from a variety of these observation based products? So here is um, our uh, look at this. Uh, and what we see is that the observationally based products in blue and the Heinkast models in green um, give us actually quite, um, quite similar patterns of variation. We have um, an ocean carbon sink that's growing over time. The observationally based product suggests slightly faster growth, but still it's growing in both cases. We have a kind of a stagnation of the ocean carbon sink occurring in the 1990s and then a recovery afterwards. And it is really this pattern here, the stagnation in the 1990s, and then the recovery afterwards that I'm going to attempt to explain um, with, uh, in the next section of the talk. Um, because only, only in really in the last couple of years do we have these consist, kind of consistent view of what the ocean carbon sink has done. Now we ask the question, you know, what caused this? Why did we have this decadal variability? Why did we have the stagnation and then the subsequent growth? So that's what I want to talk about when I talk about mechanisms of decadal variability. So I've told you about the models. I've told you about the database products. And now I want to introduce um, uh, a theoretical perspective uh, that I've developed that I believe helps us to really understand what drove this decadal variability in the ocean carbon sink. So um, to motivate the theoretical perspective, I want to start by looking at um, the, um, the, the, the global trends in the delta PCO2, a mapped view of the observational-based delta PCO2 trends over the period of the 1990s and then subsequent to that from 2002 to 2011 here. So what we noticed in looking at this is that the, if we look at the, um, the trend in delta PCO2, it's basically positive in most locations um, across the global ocean. Not perfectly so in these observation-based products, but in the, the, and this is the mean of six different products. Um, in most places, the delta PCO2 is getting smaller over the 92 to 2001 period, and that goes with the flux um, at least not increasing or maybe even declining over that period. In contrast, when we look at the following period, 2002 to 2012, or 2011, we see that pretty much everywhere across the global ocean, outside of the equatorial Pacific that has its own, um, where ENSO is really the dominant uh, driver of variability on shorter timescales. Leaving aside the equatorial Pacific, we see really pretty much everywhere this delta PCO2 is getting, getting more negative, so the sink is growing. 
The other thing that we note, uh, although not shown in the maps, is that there, in both the products and the models, we have this rapid sync growth in the early 1990s, this sort of, this very um, uh, rapid um, uh, downward or increasing sync occurring in the early 1990s. And so uh, focusing on the global coherence of these patterns here, um, we, you know, the, the first thought when you see a global, globally coherent pattern is that there's some external forcing that's driving uh, the variability that's happening, right? If, if you see a lot of, uh, you know, it's going up in the Southern Ocean and down in the Northern Hemisphere, you might think that there's an internal mode of variability. But when the essentially the whole ocean is doing the same thing, you it, it makes you think, well, maybe there's some external forcing that's driving this variability. So what might those external forcings be? Well, the first external forcing is, of course, the growing atmospheric PCO2. It's part of our equation for air sea CO2 flux, and we know it's going up quite rapidly. Um, and this is the, the, the um, annually smooth data for 1980 to 2017. So this is, you know, you could say, okay, it looks pretty linear. In fact, it's not quite linear. In fact, there's some significant deviations from linearity here. And, and that's something that we're gonna look at um, is, is the, the variability of the atmospheric growth rate off something that's strictly linear. If we look at the ocean uh, in, in the Hindcast models, the ocean PCO2 and the observationally based products, um, we see that they're going up pretty much at the same rate as the atmosphere, uh, that the difference between them is relatively constant. But of course, it's pretty hard to see this um, in, in these plots because there's such a dominant trend. So next, I'm going to remove this linear atmospheric trend so you can see both more clearly. So that's here. So now I have the deviations from this long-term growth rate of about 1.8 microatmospheres per year. And you can see the uh, relationship between the atmosphere and its um, variations in, in the growth rate and in the ocean. So we can note, for example, that there was a significant slowdown in the growth rate in the atmosphere in the early 1990s. Uh, and that is partially attributed to the, um, the fact that the um, Soviet Union collapsed and the emissions growth was really stalled for these years. But it is also because there, was, there appears to have been a significant anomaly in the land sink, taking up more carbon uh, from the atmosphere in those years. Um, the, the, the why this happened is not the point of this talk. The point is that we know the atmospheric growth rate slowed in the early 1990s. And this look shows us that the ocean also slowed down as well. And these are non-negligible changes in the uh, PCO2 of the atmosphere because they are occurring on top of a delta PCO2, a global mean delta PCO2, that's actually quite small. So the delta PCO2 atmosphere to ocean is only about five microatmospheres in the early 2000s, and it's eight microatmospheres more recently. So if over a couple years, the atmosphere slows down by four microatmospheres, um, that, that its growth rate means that it is kind of deviated from the linearity with, but with a significant anomaly, that's going to affect the delta, and that should affect the flux. The other external forcing that was very important in the 1990s was um, the, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. So we had aerosols um, going into the stratosphere, causing large-scale cooling. Uh, and in this uh, map, this is the ocean heat content, significant uh, upper ocean heat content, anomalies, cooling. Um, and this was, this was you know, really quite a significant anomaly. If we look at the forced effect of Mount Pinatubo on uh, SST here from Etabar et al. 2019, the bold gray is that forced effect. Uh, this is the average across the uh, CSM large ensemble, and the dashed line is the observed. We can see that with El Chichon and then with Mount Pinatubo, the forcing, the external forcing drove these strong negative anomalies in um, upper ocean, uh, in, in SST and also the upper ocean heat content. And so that was also a strong external forcing that had a potential to affect the ocean carbon sink. So then, so those are the external forcings. And then one begins to ask, well, okay, so those, those forcings, 
are out there, are they large enough to impact the global fluxes? And so this is where, you know, we started by, well, let's build the simplest model possible with which we can test whether the magnitude of these changes in the atmosphere and in the uh, um, upper ocean heat content, whether it could change the ocean carbon flux significantly. So developed a very simple upper ocean diagnostic box model for the global CO2 flux. It is a single box of a certain depth that is affected by an overturning circulation, bringing up waters with low anthropogenic carbon content to the surface and interacting with the atmosphere. It's a single equation where the time evolution of the DIC, the dissolved inorganic carbon, is a function of this overturning circulation, um, which is you know, just a single value that we set, the volume of the ocean and the gradient between deep and the surface. And then we have our air-sea exchange, which is a function of the atmosphere and the ocean PCO2. You will note that there's no biological term here, and that's because the biological pump is assumed to be in steady state, that the export of carbon, uh, organic carbon, is equal in each year to the um, return uh, via the circulation. And so we, both those terms cancel out and we have no need to include them in the, in the model. And so here are the constants. We're using a global mean temperature of 14C outside which is consistent with observations outside the tropics um, and a variety of, of, um, of, of parameters here. And uh, we, have, we include full carbon chemistry, and then we're going to force this model with the observed atmosphere and the volcanic uh, temperature anomalies. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. please. So is it um, the air-sea flux, is it a global integral, or you average the PCO2 ocean and the PCO2 atmosphere? Like you have one box, so I have one box, and it's it's um it is so the there's just one value that is a global ocean PCO2, um and a, and a global atmosphere PCO2. It's it's as simple as that. Yes, single box, um. And so okay, so here's the forcings. Uh, we're gonna I'm gonna look both. I I have this linear atmosphere, but I'm gonna focus on the observed this deviation from that linearity. And then I have the temperature inputs from the volcanoes, El Chichon and Pinatubo. So uh, to make things short, I'm just going to focus on what happens when I only use the observed PCO2 and when I combine the observed PCO2 with the temperature inputs uh, from the volcanoes. So forcing this model only with the um, uh, observed PCO2, and I'm going to present here the detrended PCO2 anomalies because those are just so much easier to look at. But, um, but in, the, in the model, there actually is this trend, of course, happening. So here we see the, um, the atmosphere coming down, as you saw before. And here's our box model. As the atmosphere growth rate slows, the ocean PCO2 growth rate also slows, although there's a lag because it takes a few years for the ocean to catch up to the atmosphere. What does the flux look like? I'm going to show you here that same plot of the PCO2 as I showed you before, and here's the resulting flux, reminding you that the CO2 flux is proportional simply to the difference between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, and in this model, since my uh, solubilities and all are, uh, and, and wind speeds are constant, um, it's directly proportional. So what do um, I see here? I, yes, yes, please, Jim. Sorry, just a quick question. So. Mm -hmm. I understand how you could force it with the SSTs, but this box is a little deeper. So how did you get the, um, the how deep did you know, where did you get the information to get the, um, the temperature anomaly with depth? Yeah, so, so the box is 200 meters deep. And uh, the, if you, the, the paper by Anabar et al. actually does a nice analysis of uh, the large ensemble uh, and shows that those anomalies extend at least to 200 meters. And so that's what we're, um, when we get to the temperature forcing for the volcanoes, that's what we're approximating it as. Um, okay. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the ocean heat content anomaly, I will also say, we looked at this a little bit. The ocean heat content anomaly is consistent with uh, the these observed estimates also um, when you have 200 meters with that amount of temperature change. Um, okay. 
So here, back to where, where I was, here I'm looking at the CO2 flux driven by these deltas. And what we see here is that we have um, in the early 1990s, we actually see a strong slowdown in the ocean carbon sink and then a recovery following. So essentially, as the atmospheric growth rate slows, the ocean is not forced as much by that gr growing atmosphere. And so the, and the delta gets smaller, and so the sink gets smaller. When the ocean starts to experience now a return, a regrowth in the atmosphere, the ocean starts to rec recover um, and starts to take up more carbon afterwards. However, this is not the pattern that looks like um, the observed. Remember, we had, in fact, a large uh, increase in the, in the flux in the early 1990s. So now we're going to add the volcano upper ocean heat content anomaly and see what that does. So here, now I'm adding these temperature effects of the volcanoes, and I have the same atmosphere, but in the box model, the PCO2 of the ocean goes down um, uh, quickly uh, by a couple microatmospheres in response to the Pinatubo eruption. There's also an anomaly here with El Chichon. If I look at that, um, uh, that flux anomaly here, and with the dash being the one without the volcano, I see that now I do get this strong uptake in the early 1990s, and then I get a slowed sink for the rest of the decade. So when the solubility of CO2 in the ocean increases rapidly, when Pinatubo goes off and you cool the ocean, you get this strong uh, lowering of the PCO2, this delta of PCO2 gets larger and you drive more carbon into the ocean. So you get this uptake anomaly. But then over the um, recovery period from Pinatubo, you have warming occurring um, because the ocean is recovering from that, that cool anomaly. And also you've taken up sort of a bolus of excess carbon that is already in the ocean. So the PCO2 the, of the ocean is slightly elevated. And so you don't take up as much carbon over the rest of the decade because the delta PCO2 is slightly smaller there. However, after the anomaly uh, dissipates, you return to just the growth rate due to the atmosphere alone. So essentially what we're suggesting here is that the Pinatubo um, eruption actually shifts the sink anomaly that would have occurred due to a slowed atmospheric growth rate. It shifts it from the early to the late 1990s. Um, and, uh, and so we have this uh, stalled uh, ocean carbon sink in the 1990s because Pinatubo sort of changed the timing of the sink. And, but if you look at the integrated sink, of the 80s versus the 90s, either or the later, either with or without the Pinatubo um, temperature effect, it's, it's almost the same. It's just a shifting from the early to the late of the sink. And now if I put this um, anomaly, this uh, time series from the box model against the observationally based products and the models, I see correlations that are higher, uh, that are, are, are 0.89 and higher. So we are able to, uh, you know, to first order recover much of the observed variability in the sink with this extremely simple box model. Um, and, um, and we discussed this, of course, more in the paper, uh, but our conclusions here is that the, the one, the variability of the ocean carbon sink in the 1980s is relatively, since the 1980s is relatively globally co coherent, and that we have agreement from our models and our observationally based products on this. And also that this upper ocean diagnostic model can replicate this variability given only externally forced mechanisms, two very straightforward mechanisms of the growth rate of atmospheric CO2 and the effect of Mount Pinatubo. Um, so you know, this is a, it's a first uh, look at the potential effect of the volcanoes on the, um, on the ocean carbon sink. And you know, more work is ongoing to confirm this using, for example, the CSM large ensemble run both with and without Mount Pinatubo. Uh, but uh, you know, this is, this is the, what we have so far um, on this box model. So, um, so maybe I'll take any questions on this part before I move on to the second part of my talk in the remaining 15 minutes or so that I have, or 10 minutes. Uh, Keith, go ahead. Uh, so 
some have speculated that you know volcanic eruptions are, are putting iron in the ocean and so might be stimulating the biological pump could you maybe mm -hmm. talk about that a little and how that might play into this is very very cool talk Galen. thanks thanks keith um you know we certainly don't have that in the box model, but yeah, if there was also an effect of uh, additional productivity occurring at this time, sort of an anomaly in the, um, what I would call the natural carbon cycle, the biological pump component, then that would certainly help to accomplish the same goal. Um, but but um, I do not think that that's included in any of these ocean high gas models. Um, of course, if it was in the real world, it would be in some sense captured in the observational based products. Um, but I don't think it's a necessary mechanism based on what we know so far, but you know, more analysis to happen. Uh, Jim, you have a question? Yeah, that's really interesting, Galen. Some of the uh, early work on this suggested that Pinatubo was causing a diffuse light uh, change in mm -hmm. leaf temperature and enhancement of like reducing shading in the terrestrial biosphere and that was driving the carbon sink and I'm curious if you've mm -hmm. thought about um, you know if you do the reinterpretation with this ocean carbon sink driven by the solubility like how much that would weaken the um, the need for a, a land-based carbon sink during this time. Yeah yeah so the magnitude of the I looked at that quite a bit because we had sort of hoped to do this in a coupled sense, right? Where you had some estimate of the land sink uh, also forced by Pinatubo and, and, and uh, then what the ocean responded. The challenge is that the estimates from the observations are pretty all over the place. They're between one and two petagrams excess sink in the land. And they are also uh, the diffuse radiation mechanism. It doesn't seem like that's really agreed on, although some people certainly think it is, but you know, Harvard Forest was the only uh, site that was really up in 1992, and that one has a strong diffuse radiation effect that might not affect the other forests, kind of all, you know, there's a lot of debate still. So some of the land people have said to me that, you know, well, we're waiting till the next volcano goes off, and then we'll know what happened with Pinatubo, right? Um, so, uh, so I think that the fact that this is only about half a petagram of anomaly, and the land is more like one to two, I just think the uncertainty in that sort of swamps it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, but I think that, you know, if the total anomaly was two, the ocean could have been, you know, 25 or maybe even 50% of the, of the change in the growth rate, so. Yeah, thanks. That's interesting. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. Okay, so let me spend just a few minutes talking about the a shorter next section of the talk, talking about um, going a little more in detail on these observationally based products. So um, reminding you that we are using machine learning to extrapolate from sparse PCO2 observations, uh, using satellite SST and chlorophyll and things like this to estimate the the PCO2 and then from this estimate the flux. But reminding you that these data are extremely sparse, right? And so we always have to be careful when we extrapolate, right? And we don't have really good direct ways with our machine learning to make um, uncertainty estimates on the results. So we can ask the question, you know, how accurate are these resulting products and how can we test them when the truth is unknown? We don't actually have actual full coverage observations of PCO2 against which we can test these um, extrapolation approaches. So we here uh, return to models and, and say, well, we can use the ocean models that we do have in this case, couple climate models and, and large ensembles of couple climate models. We can use them as a test bed to test the extrapolation skill of these, um, ex uh, of these observationally based products. So we take an ocean model uh, that gives us full coverage ocean PCO2, and we do this for four different large ensembles, uh, CSM, CAN-ESM, GFDL, and MPI, we get 25 members from each of these large ensembles. So we have 100 iterations of let's sample as the observations, reconstruct and test how well we can do over the period 85 to 2016. So this is the basic concept of the large ensemble test bed. We have a model, in this case, just as an example, CSM. We have 100 members. We sample each model member as the SOCAT PCO2 observations. We train, test, and evaluate the neural network 
We're working with Peter Landschutzer using his SOMFFN approach, which is one of the first and most commonly used. Then we can estimate uh, the PCO2 and, and of course uh, calculate the flux. And then we have this additional step, which we don't have in the real world, which is we can statistically compare the reconstructed CO2 flux to the model truth. Um, and we can temporar temporarily decompose that um, for every point in space. So we can take each ensemble member um, and reconstruction and look at the full signal, detrend it, seasonal, decadal variability, subdecadal variability, and ask, you know, how well does our reconstruction do on these different timescales, as well as, of course, for the mean. So specifically, when we test the skill, we're going to be looking at the long-term mean. Is there a bias between the models and the reconstruction? We're going to ask about the phasing. Is do we have you know uh, the seasonal cycles, for example, um, the peaks of them happening at the right time or not? And we can ask about the amplitude. Is the magnitude of the seasonality or of the decadal variability consistent uh, between the reconstructed and the original model? So skipping right into the uh, results of this study. We can show for the SOMFFN, when we average across 100 of these large ensemble test bed members, that the global bias in the, um, uh, the air CO2 flux is actually quite small uh, and uh, is smaller, uh, smallest in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's where there are more observations, and is certainly larger in some parts of the Southern Hemisphere, um, even though those uh, pluses and minuses and bias do average out globally. Um, but this gives us a beginning of an idea of if you were someone who was particularly interested in the South Indian Ocean, uh, you might want to be concerned about bias in the product um, because of, um, because you, know, you just probably don't have enough sampling to fully constrain that, uh, that mean flux there. But if you just want to look at the zonal average um, CO2 flux or the global mean, the products seem to be doing quite well or for larger scale averages. If we look at the correlation, uh, is the reconstruction phase right compared to the original model? This is a, a yellows are correlations of 0.8 or greater. Um, we see that for the seasonal cycle, the, the, the uh, the, these products, the neural network here does extremely well in capturing the seasonal cycle. And that's both, you know, at pretty much everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, even in the Southern Hemisphere, um, in the subtropics, um, less, a bit less so in the uh, Southern Ocean. But on the whole, the, the correlation uh, globally average is about 0.85, so quite good. However, on the decadal timescale, so, so now looking at much longer timescale variations, we see the correlations are much lower. Um, and uh, so that we're saying here that the decadal phasing is much harder to reconstruct. Pretty good in the Western Equatorial Pacific, which is interesting, but otherwise correlations are you know, 0.6 or even quite, quite dismally low, about 0.2 or 0.1. And then the standard deviation uh, um, of the percent error, which is asking about the amplitude of the variation. So how what is the amplitude of seasonal variability? Um, and here is the map of the percent error. We can see that it's pretty close to zero in most places, higher in the Indian Ocean, for example, where data is quite sparse. And here is uh, some zonal averages. This is uh, greater than 35 north in the 35 to 35 bounds and in great, in less than 35 south, so Southern Hemisphere. So we can see that, you know, Really, we do quite well um, on, on, you know, slightly overestimating the amplitude of variability see, uh, seasonally, but, but I think it's pretty encouraging. However, if we look decadally, uh, we see that uh, we have some real problems, particularly in the Southern Ocean. Uh, in the Southern Ocean, we see that we have an overestimate of the decadal variability by about 39%. So pretty much everywhere, uh, this approach seems to be giving us too much variability in the Southern Ocean, which is uh, an important result because there's been a lot of a lot of papers suggesting that uh, the models, the Heinkast models, are in fact underestimating variability because of these products suggesting larger decadal variability. And this result suggests that probably the products are overestimating the amplitude of that decadal variability. <laughs> 
So um, the last test we want to do, and one of the value of the test bed, is that we can also ask the question, well, what if we had more samples? What if we weren't so data constrained in the Southern Ocean? What if we had more data there? So uh, we have now, in, in, a, in, a, in the last test in this study, we added float-based sampling in the Southern Ocean. We added it um, it, it, you know, in a kind of idealized sense, we said, what if every float that has ever been out there sampled every year from 1985 to 2016? So that's a lot more samples, but it's still only 2.1% of the global ocean before we had about one and a half percent of all points of the global ocean. Now we have 2.1%. So it's not a huge, huge increase. And here now we're looking again at this decadal variability, how how, how much are we over or underestimating the variability? And we see that we have really um, uh, killed this problem of too much uh, decadal variability in the Southern Ocean. So compared um, to, um, to this one here, where we had this problem of a significant overestimate of the decadal variability in the Southern Ocean, now we, we look uh, quite good. So this tells us that, yeah, we really do need more samples and that even, even if it was only 2% of all points of the global ocean, um, we, could we could reconstruct a cable variability. So now we need to go out and take a couple decades of, of observations, whether it be with floats or with ships to fill in some of the holes. So, um, and then the last thing I'll just mention real quick, cause I am running out of time. Um, we can also use this large ensemble test bed to test other common machine learning methods, um, such as uh, random forest, XGBoost, and also our, our own uh, approach to the neural nets. And we can compare the relative strengths and weaknesses of different approaches in terms of capturing seasonality. This is the amplitude metric, subdecadal variability, and decadal variability. So we see, for example, here that, you know, the XGBoost approach is actually the best at the seasonality, basically zero in terms of the um, seasonal um, uh, amplitude error. It's also the best at the subdecadal, although there's some areas of problem. However, the, the neural network is actually better than um, the XGBoost at getting the decadal variability. So these different machine learning approaches have uh, different strengths and weaknesses. And having something like the test bed is one way that we can um, sort of understand better what we're doing before we start applying it to the real world. Um, and then I'll just note that this reduced decadal amplitude here, going back to the global scale, um, if we had reduced decadal amplitude in these products, it would, um, a, it would move us towards more the, the high cast models and would reduce the disagreement, the apparent disagreement in these estimates. So the point is just to say that reduced decadal variability in the products would bring our, our various approaches here to greater agreement. So um, my conclusions, just adding to this, um, these machine learning based approaches to reconstructing PCO2 really do seem to do a pretty good job at capturing the mean and seasonality of the PCO2. Um, the, the reconstruction approaches are honestly more robust than I expected them to be when we started this project. Um, and that, and, and, but it is the, the data sparsity that's really, really a real challenge uh, and that needs to be filled in. So I will stop my talk there and be happy to take any other questions. Thank you, Galen. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, uh, please put up your hand or post them in the chat and I'll read them out. Uh, yeah, Keith, go ahead. Hey, could you flip back one slide to that global? Um, this one or this one? Yeah, no, no, the, uh, this one. that one, yeah. I think, you, you know, what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me it's hard to see how the you know the gcm oceans could be underestimating uptake by a full you know pedogram in 2015 mm -hmm. because in on the short time scales that uptake is so tied to sst and we know that's fairly accurate you know in these models it, it's hard to see how they could be that far off but it's easier to see how some of the machine learning <laughs> could be that far off, at least in my mind. Uh, so I think it's it's great that you're looking like critically at these different machine learning approaches and products. 
because I feel like there's not nearly enough of that going on out in the field. Everyone's just running willy nilly and applying these things and saying, well, here's the answer. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it's, yeah. Um, Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's right. And I think that, you know, what one of the things we're moving forward with this is we're saying, you know, because we can get our, um, our, our mean pretty well, and our seasonality pretty well in the products. Now we have uh, a pretty strong basis to say, well, let's really compare hard to those models and try to say, you know, maybe there are, give a better um, sense of where the models need to improve, but let's not be so focused on decadal variability when it's so poorly constrained by what we have right now. Let's focus on the mean and the seasonality. Um, and let's, let's do the work for what we actually have constrained. Um, and I think that that's, um, uh, I think we spend a lot of time focused on, oh, the models aren't decadal, giving us enough decadal variability. And I think that's kind of a little, a bit of a red herring. Um, I so, think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. I had something else, but I'll, maybe I'll come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> can I, I can ask a question. Do you have any sure. sense if the decadal variability if the part that is due to temperature changes might be captured correctly in the neural networks, but parts that are due to changes in circulation would do more poorly. Mm. Is there any way to tease that apart? I would think that mm. there less signatures of overturning change if they're not reflected in the temperature, but I don't know. That is a good question, right? I mean, uh, I haven't thought about it, but yeah, you could ask, in the test bed, how well can you separately reconstruct the temperature component of PCO2 um, versus the non-temperature, everything else, the residual, and ask and, and do this same analysis as I have here and ask if, if the temperature looks just fine, but in fact, it's the non-temperature part that looks wrong. And then that would suggest that it is the, um, the non-temperature component that's the, um, that is, not sampled well enough to reconstruct in the real world. Um, we have not done that, but it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, it would be cool to look at um, like mixed layer depth variability and mixing events if there's mm -hmm. any, because I don't know if that goes into the neural networks or not. Just the climate. Yeah, the it's just the climatological. So we're basically using the Argo climatology mixed layer depths. Um, uh, yeah, so we. Variable mixed layers are not included. The only variable parameters are um, in the networks right now are the um, are the SST uh, the, and the chlorophyll and the XCO2. The salinity and, and the mixed layer depths are climatological. Um, and actually the chlorophyll is also climatological pre-1998. So it's primarily SST uh, at driving the variations. A and then XCO2, which causes the long-term growth of the PCO2. Very good. Very interesting. Keith, you have another question? Your hand is up still. Yep. Well, you know, the Earth system models capture mean chlorophyll and, and the seasonal cycle really well. But then even in hindcast mode, they have almost no predictability at the interannual um, mm -hmm. the decadal. So that, that might be where your noise lies <laughs> on the biology side. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, um, it might not... Right, right. I agree. Um, I think one of the things I was talking about, I think with Francois or somebody earlier, that these tests um, with the Earth system models really are not, um, they're like, uh, uh, they're not a complete test of the capability of the reconstruction, right? Because when we sample these models, we have perfect information about the, the PCO2 and the related SST and chlorophyll and everything like that, right? We are using the climatologies, not the changing mixed layer depths to be consistent with what's done in the data, but we have the right climatology, right? So what we haven't done and what we could do is add, for example, measurement noise. We could add represent, representativity noise, the fact that you're taking PCO2 that might have, you know, 100 observations in a one-by-one -one grid cell to make a one-by-one -one estimate or maybe even 10, you know. So there's more you could do with it. But I think what we're saying here is really we're testing, you know, this is like a, a necessary test, right? If with even with perfect information and this approach, you can't get the decadal variability, you're certainly not going to get it if you add uh, measurement uh, measurement noise and all these other things. Um, 
Uh, yeah. Is there any other questions or should we uh, thank Galen and let her go have her dinner since she's on the East Coast and it's uh, getting late. Any, if there are any questions, say so. Otherwise, let's thank her again. Nice uh, talk, Galen. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone Great. for coming. <laughs>